Welcome, everybody. Uh, good uh, afternoon, good evening, good day, wherever you are. And uh, I'm very excited to uh, have you here at this panel uh, on uh, using data in the fight against the pandemic. Did it work for South America? So this is the topic that we are going to dis discuss in the next uh, 90 minutes. Uh, and I'm uh, the moderator of this panel. Uh, my name is uh, Oskar Stein, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Groningen, Campus Friesland, where I'm also a member of the Data Research Center. Today, we have the opportunity to discuss this topic together with uh, renowned experts from uh, South America and all over the world, who will provide us with different disciplinary insights on how uh, data-driven measures have been actually used uh, to contain the pandemic. We will look at international practices, but we will also see what has been happening in the region, how it has played out. And then we will hopefully together with you discuss uh, the impact of these measures, the usefulness of these measures. And as uh, you probably know, when you follow uh, this live stream, uh, there is lots to discuss. Um, we're, we're all still uh, living through this and uh, have, to, have to handle with it. And so it is definitely a very timely topic uh, to think about. But uh, before I proceed introducing the topic, I was told that, uh, it's, uh, uh, that we read out a disclaimer uh, before getting into the discussion. So um, I'm starting with that right now. So the comments made by Fundação uh, Getulio Vargas employees and guests during online events and broadcasts exclusively represent their opinions and not necessarily FGV's institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone present here has agreed to participate in this event spontaneously and with this authorize the use of their name, voice and image in addition to seed property copyright scans related to their exposure for this transmission, which will be made available later on FGV's official channels. To continue with this transition, we ask that you express yourself verbalizing or signaling your agreement. So I'm asking my speakers whether we can proceed. Thank you very much. And um, with this, uh, yeah, uh, again, the topic of this uh, panel is uh, how data-driven measures have been used to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. Obviously, data has played uh, an essential role in, um, you know, the, the struggle and the, the fight against COVID-19. Um, those vaccines that have been developed could not have been um, made ready that fast without uh, the use of data, without the possibility to sequence the virus, for instance, as fast uh, as it was, uh, as it happened. But at the same time, and this is the topic that we are going to discuss here and look at from different kind of uh, angles, uh, also governments and uh, have turned to using um, data-driven measures whether that's location data, whether that's the development of COVID-19 uh, apps for digital contact tracing or uh, monitoring symptoms, or more recently, the certification of either um, testing, recovery, or vaccination. All of, these, all of these are measures and programs that governments all over the world have started to introduce to also mitigate the impact of the pandemic and to control populations. And with this increased use of data, uh, there are also concerns by uh, privacy scholars, by data protection scholars all over the world, if this data is only being used for good, whether this data will actually only be used for specific purposes, very, targeting very clearly the pandemic, or whether this data will also be used once the pandemic is over, whenever it is over, and uh, all of these are issues that uh, our uh, distinguished set of speakers will address uh, from their own perspectives throughout um, yeah, the following uh, the next minute. So I'm talking uh, to introduce you a little bit into the set, into how this is going to play out. So I'm going to start now with briefly introducing the speakers in reverse order. We have uh, five speakers. And all of them have around 10 minutes to uh, present their own views and their thoughts. 
In the meanwhile, I will share their uh, presentations. And when we are uh, done with uh, listening to all of the speakers, we encourage you to ask questions in the chat. You can do so uh, in uh, Portuguese, Spanish, and English. But on the panel, we also speak uh, Hebrew, uh, German, and Dutch. So don't don't feel that you are restricted to being uh, having to use English. You can use uh, whichever language, whichever of these languages that we can that you can answer to, and we will be more than happy to receive uh, questions from you and have a guinea discussion. I'm sure everybody of you also has an opinion. So let's get started. I said I would introduce the speakers in reverse order. And uh, so this means that uh, the last speaker that we will have the privilege to listen to is uh, Oshrat Ayalon. She's a postdoctoral post researcher in the safety and society group at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems in Saarbrücken, Germany. Thank you for joining us, Oshrat. Then before her, uh, Regiana Alimonti will speak, who is a senior policy analyst at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Thank you for joining us. Then uh, before that, we will listen to Juan Diego Castaneda, who is a researcher at uh, Fundación Carisma, a Colombian NGO that has worked a lot on um, what has been done in this field in, in Colombia and will share his findings and insights. And um, then the speaker before that will be uh, Christian Perone, who is a lawyer, public con policy consultant, and coordinator of the rights and technology team at the Institute for Technology and Society of Rio de Janeiro. And uh, we will start with the presentation by my colleague Thais uh, Fernanda Blaut, who is a PhD researcher at the Department of Governance and Innovation at the University of Groningen Campus Friesland where she's also a member of the Data Research Center. Her project is on artificial intelligence and international relations. And over the last year, she has also done uh, research on uh, best practices relating to data-driven measures to mitigate COVID-19. Thais, uh, the floor is yours, and I'm going to share your presentation in a sec. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, as Oscar has already mentioned, uh, my name is Thais Fernanda Blaut. I am a PhD researcher at the University of Groningen in Campus Friesland. Uh, and today I'm going to talk with you more about uh, best practices and guiding principles uh, when we are talking about data-driven measures developed during the pandemic. Uh, so, Oscar, uh, if you can... Is the presentation working? I think it should, uh, no? Yes, there you go. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so since the pandemic started, uh, governments have developed uh, many different strategies to deal with all these challenges that we've been facing. Uh, and one of them was this surge uh, in the use of data and technology as options to try to mitigate some of the impacts of COVID. Um, and this uses is spanned from different areas, uh, as Oscar has already introduced some of them. Uh, and as you can also see in this chart, uh, in this slide, and while some of the systems may offer um, public health benefits, they can also put at risk uh, individuals' privacy, data protection, and also other uh, fundamental rights. So the pandemic has also served as an excuse by some governments uh, for the adoption of some problematic emergency measures in many countries. Uh, and in this sense, it's important to um, also think about what we, um, that we have different socio-technological contexts around the globe. So even though there are a lot of studies being published on the effectiveness of some of these measures, uh, we always have to keep in mind that the results are not always comparable. So something that works in South America, for example, might not work in Europe and vice versa. If you could go to the next slide. And uh, as I mentioned, there are many different types of data-driven measures uh, that were developed. I just highlighted here the three, three main clusters uh, that I think are going to be discussed during this uh, panel. So the first one is planning and tracking. Um, so big data, artificial intelligence, uh, and all different technologies have been used to plan strategies uh, and also to track, for example, the spread of the disease. Um, we experienced some of these examples with, for example, migration maps, which were um, using data from mobile phones, from social media, to collect data on the location of people and to really see how the disease was spreading. This was more also in the beginning of the pandemic. 
And then we also have the contact tracing apps. Um, so there are many different apps, applications developed around the globe with different approaches, different configurations. Uh, and the main idea is to really identify and track people who might have been in contact uh, with an infected person. And then we do have the vaccine passports nowadays, which are um, under scrutiny as well, um, which are also called uh, immunity passports. So these are the credentials the, um, given to people to prove that they have been vaccinated already. So if people want to travel for a given, uh, to a given country, for instance, they can show um, this vaccine passport to the authorities. Um, and some countries have already confirmed that they will make this uh, one kind of one of their strategies moving forward with the pandemic. So we will probably see much more of this debate in the couple, next couple of months uh, as well um, in South America. So the next slide, please. Uh, when we are developing these apps uh, and other data-driven measures, it's important to follow some uh, guiding principles, some best practices to avoid abuse. Uh, and I will highlight here today for you six of them. So the first one is voluntary use. Um, so people should be able to decide if they want to download and use the apps through opt-in systems. Um, and they should also be able to delete applications at any time. Uh, having explicit and individual consent is also important. Um, and in general, what we observed in South America is that most of the apps follow this principle, which means that individuals were not um, coerced into downloading and using systems. Uh, but there are exceptions. So one example is the case of Argentina. So last year, the government published um, an official document determining that people entering the country uh, were obliged to download um, and use the app for at least 14 days. Um, but in general, as I mentioned, the apps were uh, voluntary. Then we also have purpose limitation. So all the data shared through the apps uh, and systems should be collect collected and used only for legitimate health uh, goals, which should be clear right from the outset. And um, using data for other purposes, should, such as commercial, political, um, national security purpose should be avoided uh, to prevent abuses, but also to as a strategy to increase the uptake of the apps, because then people, uh, when people know that they can trust the application, they trust, they can trust that their data will not be used for other purposes, they might be more willing as well to use these um, systems. Then we have uh, good data minimization, uh, which must be at the center of the strategy. It should be employed in all parts of the system. Uh, so apps and other data-driven measures should collect and store as little data as necessary. Um, and here, I believe it's interesting to mention the different approaches that were adopted for the contact tracing apps. Um, so a good practice would be to reduce the amount of data being collected by these uh, applications. Um, and then uh, what many countries have done is to uh, adopt the decentralized approach which is the um, when this app is uh, when the data collected for this app is stored locally on the user's device and this is a contrast to the centralized approach in which the data is stored on a server controlled by a national authority so this we can also count as a good a good practice when uh, developing these apps the next one please and then we have uh, transparency so transparency is um, of course, important for people to have a clear understanding of what is at stake when they decide or not to download an app. Uh, because people might be suspicious, for example, about an initiative, uh, they will be um, they will not be as willing to download the app as uh, they would be if the, if the transparency was in, in place. So being transpar transparent also helps uh, for the measures to be adopted by the public and be then more effective as well. And to reach this transparency, there are two good practices that can be followed. So the first one would be to write uh, privacy policies that uh, contain all the necessary information for the user's uh, informed consent. And this includes also that um, what data is collected, for what purpose, in what form, uh, for how long they will keep the data, with whom they are shared with, um, among other things. And then another good practice that we've also seen during this, this pandemic um, and that helps with transparency is making the source code uh, program available for the public. 
Uh, and when the source code is available, it can be accessed, it could be audited and reviewed by third parties. Um, and we've seen some examples here in Europe, such as in Germany and Switzerland, but also in South America. We identified that in Argentina, uh, the source code for the Quidar app, for instance, was also made available a, a couple of months uh, after the development. So this is also a good strategy that can be um, considered for transparency purposes. Then we have privacy and data protection by design and default. Um, so some of the systems developed during the pandemic were not uh, privacy friendly. Um, and here is important to note that if systems are not, um, the systems were not only violating the rights of the users, that would be what, which would be already very problematic, but uh, this also implicates in endangering the very goal of these apps because they would lead to mistrust. People wouldn't download the app, wouldn't use, and the uh, goal wouldn't be fulfilled. So uh, here there are two, two main issues to be considered when we talk about privacy. And uh, for these reasons, uh, systems should uh, support data anonymization, uh, cryptographic techniques, and uh, other measures to secure the data, and also to prevent further harms in case a leak occurs. Um, so also the data is, um, that is also difficult or impossible to anonymize, sh such as location data, shouldn't be used uh, at all, it should be avoided uh, whenever possible. And finally, we have the exit strategy. So once the emergency is over, all the systems developed for the pandemic uh, should be terminated. Uh, so when a new measure is developed, it would be important to define right at the beginning, right from the outset, um, who will determine the termination of this uh, system, by when, following which kind of criteria, uh, and so forth. And it has to be clear um, when can this operation be seized, uh, when it should be terminated due for also any, uh, the lack of effectiveness, for instance, uh, and other cases. And this uh, helps with uh, avoiding mission creep, a continuation of the data-driven measure uh, after the pandemic um, has over, after the emergency period um, has ended. And so what can we learn from the experiences, from the things that we've seen during this uh, one year and seven months of pandemic? uh is that first of all technology can help uh it has many very good uses uh but it has to be part of a wider strategy so most of these after uh, these efforts that we are talking about for example the contact tracing apps they are experimental which means that they might not be effective so we have seen this surge in this kind of applications uh, since the pandemic started and until this moment the evidence around their uh, effectiveness is still inconclusive so it's uh, really important to um, combine those measures with other um, types of measures. And um, in this sense, it's also important to note that, for example, uh, even if at some point uh, there is a study saying, for example, that in the Netherlands, the contact tracing app was really effective, was really good. That does not mean that it would be as good in other countries because of the different contexts, the different infrastructures that these countries have. Um, so this is important to keep in mind as well. Uh, and also that this uh, te technological um, instrument should also be uh, considered as a strategy and that the government has to think about ways of increasing trust with the population for it to be more um, effective. And then the second point is that for the effectiveness of the measures, guiding principles should be at the core of the data-driven strategies. So um, this means that there are some serious concerns from the perspective of privacy and data protection, as Oscar has already highlighted before as well. Um, so the collection, the storage, the analysis of the data can be abused by companies, by uh, organizations, by malicious act actors, and so forth. Um, and this means that uh, processes guaranteeing, for example, privacy by design and default are really necessary to, to build this uh, trust and to make sure that uh, no abuses are occurring. Um, and more than that, we also have to think that um, what we are doing now might serve as, as a precedent. Uh, it could be uh, something that in the future we would uh, develop things that are similar, so we have to do it right, uh, right now. And then finally, uh, not everything can or should be sold by Kodi and App. So I think it's just very important and that, that we are careful when it comes to creating apps with the goal of solving complex problems, uh, because um, 
it's really uh, complex to have this techno solutionist framings with these apps uh, when uh, they are very limited in what they can do sometimes. So um, it's important to use technology as an ally, but uh, not as a savior of us all. And uh, I think with that, I conclude my presentation. Uh, I'll be more than happy to discuss this further with you during the Q&A. But uh, for now, thank you very much. I think that was it. Oh, and here are some sources that would be useful. <laughs> oh, yeah. OK, so great. The, the kicks us off in the, in the discussion. So we are, we are taking these uh, best practices, and uh, we're moving on to uh, Christian, uh, who, um, as I told you already, among his, his many affiliations and expertise, uh, also um, has looked at how these best practices played out in, in the region, but also with a particular focus, I, I think, on Brazil. So Christian, please, uh, the floor is yours and your presentation will come in a second. No worries. Thank you very much, Oscar. It's fantastic to be able to be here with you today and uh, to discuss uh, this is a very important matter. So to talk about this interaction between data solutions, data driven solutions and uh, what has happened during the pandemic. And as Thais put it this very well, it set the stage for a big discussion on how it has played out in Brazil in the last the last few years. So since the beginning of the pandemic. And particularly, it's quite interesting to have this, this bear in mind what she said about the context. So in many ways, these data-driven solutions, they, they have a very good in impact, and they may be able to play a very important role in solve some of the issues that we are feeling, facing today in our, uh, in, our, in, our, in our lives, and particularly to in implementing different types of uh, public policies co concerning fighting the pandemic. And, but we have to understand that different contexts, different situations, they might impact not only the fact that you're gonna work with data protection, but we also have to, whether these uh, solutions might be able to be effective within the framework of our different countries and about Latin America in, in general. So uh, what I wanted to say in the beginning is basically that we have to understand a few issues that are available uh, throughout the context of what is in Latin America, the use of data. So I would say that there are three main main points that uh, we have to be to bear in mind when we are talking about the context of Latin America. And Thais already pushed on the idea that we have to look at infrastructure. And this is definitely the main point that's very different all over the world. So. Uh, Connectivity is one, one big issue. It's not everywhere the same. And particularly in, when you look at Latin America, you see that there are places that mm, you have more access to, to in the internet, less access, less, less access to the internet. So this is one uh, particular issue that you have to bear in mind when you need a data-driven solution. A second issue is exactly access to technology. So not every single place uh, in, the uh, in the different countries in Latin America have the same access and not even not every single individual actually has access to, to the internet, particularly high speed internet and even mobile technology is not the same. Uh, there are places that 4G network not there yet. And uh, one last bit is that data is not necessarily available. When you look for uh, solutions based on health data, uh, in most of the countries in Latin America, what we have seen is that uh, even though we have apps, we have some structure, we have the use of many of uh, uh, tools of big data, have seen that access to the structure that data necessary is not necessarily there. Uh, and and this is one issue that have been discussed. Uh, um, so now moving on from Latin America to the Brazil in itself, uh, what we have a different local context, uh, and this context may may go in in three important directions. Particularly, can you move on to the fourth slide, please? This is just a mm -hmm. second. So just to clarify, yeah. do, do do the colleagues see the the presentation now? Now we do. Now we do. 
Okay, sorry. Uh, no worries. Yeah. So, so now I'm looking at the local context, so talking about Brazil, there are three important things that we have to bear, to bear in mind. First is that uh, until very recently, there was no data protection, general data protection law in Brazil. There were sectoral uh, pieces of law and it entered in, into force in the midst of this pandemic. And this has a very important aspect to, in our discussion today, particularly uh, on the fact that we didn't have exactly the whole uh, legal infrastructure to discuss the different topics and the different themes regarding uh, data protection. A second is that it's it's the way the Brazilian political infrastructure is divided. We have a, a very federal country, which there was, we're going to enter into that, but it becomes a very political struggle in between different countries, different uh, a political entities from municipalities to, to state governments and the federal government. So there was a, a difficulty in finding which types of solutions would be available in that data-driven uh, uh, understandings and data-driven solutions, actually. So it would be municipals, state level, or uh, national, national levels. And this led to two big... Can you push the next slide? two big discussions uh, within the federal uh, Supreme Courts, sorry, uh, in Brazil. One regarding who could actually provide the solutions, who could actually take uh, the initiative. And, uh, to be, and obviously the Supreme Court said that all levels of government should to participate in taking decisions and as well in regards to data-driven solutions. Can you move to the next slide? And there was a big discussion as well with how we should actually discuss the the uh, the, infra the legal infrastructure in the data protection uh, of data protection in Brazil, and this led to a very important uh, case discussed at the Supreme Court as well, uh, talking about telco data for uh, for a census. But this has a very major implication because exactly as I as I mentioned before, we didn't. Uh, we didn't have in force, in place, uh, a general data protection regulation, and it entered into force only later. So when the Supreme Court stated that those protections were already enshrined in our constitution, it had a very important impact on how to understand which data-driven solutions could be available and how it could be available as well. That's why uh, um, we moved to the consequences of all this scenarios. So the first consequence, consequence is that, for instance, in Brazil, we'd never had uh, an in-place, implemented, uh, a contact tracing solution or many data-driven solutions that could be in place in the country because political disputes, difficulties in understanding what, are, what would be the, the legal implications of the data protection uh, and not in place that enter into force only later on. So even those uh, initiatives that were discussed within the major national government were actually not put 100% into place differently from other countries, like for instance, as mentioned in, uh, in Argentina and as Juan will talk a little bit later in Colombia. Uh, another consequences of that is that there were some uh, some data driven uh, solutions or data driven ideas put into place. Where one of them is to understand the, the level of iso social isolation, which was very well discussed in the early stages, in the first months, uh, with which was using a series of different types of data, not necessarily personal data, because most of it was considered under anonymized data, particularly uh, from uh, telcos and uh, other types of apps, as we mentioned here in one, uh, one very important startup in Brazil, which is called Inloco, which actually uh, put forward this uh, index of social isolation in the country. A second consequence is use other types of technologies as well uh, that would, uh, in order to establish some certain levels uh, of data in order to take public policy decisions uh, in the country concerning the pandemic. One interesting uh, solution we can highlight is actually absolutely the use of drones in order to understand and to disincentivize people to uh, get together in public spaces, as has happened in, in a capital of a state in Brazil, in Recife, 
uh, as we see in, at this uh, at this photograph as well. And the third consequence uh, consequences is that we actually have the use of data for. Uh, as, uh, many levels in, in the country, particularly, and we can highlight the use of massive collection of data, including for taking other types of public policy decisions, as, for instance, to give access to uh, emergency benefits. This has an, an interesting positive aspect because you can provide uh, access to this benefits for the people that actually deserve or should have access to this benefit, but also has a very creeping potential that we have to deal with in the in the coming months and years, which is what's going to happen with this massive collection of data that we're happening for those people there. And uh, under this, this idea of a massive collection of data for the benefits, we have two things that have to be in mind. So one uh, is that most of this data refers to a very uh, specific groups and sectors of the population, particularly the most vulnerable and probably the ones that need to be more protected on, on, in terms of data protection themselves in order not to have potential issues of discrimination or exclusion in the future. So the question is, as Thais put it in, uh, very well in the end, there is what's going to happen with this data in the future. How, what are the uses that are going to happen to this data? Can we use it in an anonymized fashion? Can we use it? Can, should we uh, simply erase this data after its its period of time of finishing its particular objective of providing uh, emergency emergency benefits? And which is the period of time that we're going to have? in order to use its data in the future. So what we happen, we happen under this context is that we have some potential solutions that were put in place. Some that happened in the world were not put in place in Brazil because of one, political disputes. Second, because of uh, insecurity on how it's going to happen. What is the legal regime that happened in the country? And third, even though we needed a lot of data, not all data was structured. So, and, and this can be highlighted by the need to have this massive collection of data for this uh, emergency benefits and through this uh, maybe putting very fast into place types of uh, apps that we had uh, in the past. So thank you very much. And those are the main ideas for this case study on Brazil and the use of data during the pandemic. Yeah, wonderful. Great, uh, Christian. I think uh, when you look at it in an international context, the uh, federalism aspect actually also comes up in a lot of uh, European countries, for instance, or in the United States as well, right? Uh, so I think we can also draw parallels there. Obviously, the question also remains what will happen to the state in the future. Another interesting point to discuss maybe with this audience would be how could pseudonymization and anonymization actually work out? And I think uh, also from what you mentioned in the case law, from what I read in the literature is that a lot of people actually were very optimistic that this discussion of the use of data during COVID uh, somehow became a catalyst for the, for the development and further development of the Brazilian data protection framework, right? Um, so, right. So uh, I think all of these are things that we can take forward to the discussion. And uh, now we move from uh, Brazil to Colombia, where uh, Juan Diego has, has carried out his research for Fundacion uh, Charisma. I will uh, go again and uh, fetch the slides. Juan, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, <clears throat> And thank you, thank you all. Uh, I think it's really nice to do these, and particularly after Chris's points, which I, I think uh, they all make sense, and the, the principles that I were mentioning, I think that's very interesting because maybe Colombia is, uh, is a case in which you can uh, check each one of these and, and see how they were, not, uh, they were not aligned. So yeah, the, the name of the presentation is the name of our report we made on this issue is called uh, useless and dangerous. And uh, this is just a quick way uh, to characterize the, the situation in Colombia. Next 
please, next slide. Um, because uh, data, and particularly data gathered through apps designed or presented for, the, for managing the COVID crisis, ended up um, disconnected from the health system, and uh, they came back to people as surveillance and punishment and discrimination, as I will try to explain now. So next, please. Yeah, the first, the first part is the disconnection. So the, we had one main app, and in our uh, research, we studied one, the, the national app, and three other uh, apps from, from uh, different regions. And up, uh, the idea was that Corona app, which was the, the name of the national app, was supposed to be the national and the only one or the main app to manage uh, the COVID crisis, right? So what happened in practice is there was a proliferation of apps, but also you could try to understand different motives behind this proliferation. And one of them, which is, I think, particularly relevant for this discussion is the um, the opportunity and the opportunity for tech development. Uh, so Medellin Major, Medellin's Major, which is one of the cities and one of the apps we, we studied, said that uh, the app shows uh, through the development of the app, they show the conviction that the current local government has, um, which is a commitment to technology as a means to solve major city problems and public challenges. So the, the, the speaks, that speaks a lot about what they were trying to do and how um, they were uh, placing some faith in the apps. Um, but at the national level, uh, the drive came also from the tech sector against the health sector. So uh, we had a lot of um, development and presentation, the like public response from the tech sector of the government, while the, the health sector was more silent or less reliant on apps. Uh, so as I'm going to show, please, next. Um, the the health system had these um, these established and traditional ways of moving moving information. So we have a national health institute which was in charge of the epidemiological surveillance, and they quickly introduced COVID as one of the uh, one of the issues they were tracking, and they created a module specifically for gathering information on the results of uh, tests, uh, COVID tests. And that is mainly the, the main source of information on, on the COVID crisis in Colombia. And they also have that that is kind of the passive uh, the, the passive way in which they track the, the COVID crisis. Uh, and the information flows from uh, healthcare providers on municipalities up to departments with uh, from and their health uh, departments on these uh, municipalities up to the national level and to this big uh, system of information called Civihila, which is kind of in the middle of this of the slide. And uh, from this information, decision, decisions are taken and this information is gathered and moved to other purposes, health, uh, in any case, inside the health um, care system, but they come back to municipalities in form of decisions and allocation of resources. So that is kind of the passive, uh, the passive uh, surveillance uh, way to, to track COVID. And the active one inside the health system was uh, the contact tracing with field uh, teams and actually people going and checking on systems, uh, ch checking on cases and um, gathering information on the contact uh, contacts of people uh, that resulted positive. So this information, uh, Corona app in the end was not part of the system up until July 2020, last year. Uh, Corona app was finally uh, considered inside the health system, and it was only a layer. That was kind of the way they presented uh, what Corona app was, a layer of information, so people could report the, the symptoms, and this information could be considered by Sivihila, but this information was going to be checked against the system. So in the end, the important information was the one um, that appeared in Sivihila, not the one that appeared in the app. And... Um, the municipalities sometimes they never received information from Corona app, and in the end, only 22% of alerts issued by Corona app were monitored by municipalities. So that kind of shows how little uh, impact this information made inside the already established um, health uh, information system. So uh, in the end, other apps also were not part of the strategy. The other apps I'm going to talk about later, they were not part of the strategy, but they were uh, implemented in a way that in the end caused harm 
to people as I'm going to show. And last, the mobility status that was part of the of the strategy and part of some apps ended up not having a, an, um, a use from the health, uh, a public health perspective, but ended up just giving a police a tool to police the the uh, compliance with quarantines and other measures, lockdowns, and other different measures that, that were taken not related to, to data. So next one, please. Um, as I was saying, lockdowns were first uh, police measures. They were not uh, they were not connected precisely with health needs. Although data sometimes were claimed to be the justification, the the arguments grounds for taking decisions on lockdowns and localized or sectorized lockdowns. But uh, in the end, uh, the point of lockdowns and the connection with apps was the creation of exemptions to go out uh, and to do certain activities to prove that you were part of certain ex exemptions to the lockdowns. And that was kind of the use of many apps. Also, apps were created to um, uh, provide social benefits, as I'm going to, to explain. So um, also, data protection, just, just because it, it seems really relevant, data protection was weak and weakened, and not by legal or the what we will think they're legally established means. So legal protections for the data protection are established in laws. And for example, for the census data, we have a law that protects the data and it's only supposed to be used for uh, census purposes. The uh, data protection authority and a decree which doesn't have the proper level of law uh, exempted uh, these, this protection for the uses of, of the COVID. Also, uh, metadata from communications and businesses was uh, allowed to be used when authorities require them. And some explanations were made, but in the end, just in the legal level, this was done in a, in a way which is not completely legal. So, for example, the case of Medellin, next one, please. Uh, Medellin is one of the cities that employed uh, these big applications and more, more than that, information systems. So what they required from people was a lot of information and they had two modules, the module uh, for families and the module of uh, businesses. And the module of families basically wanted to, in the end, the whole, the whole strategy was to categorize family groups and to determine who was, who was vulnerable and who needed help uh, from the government. But it ended up being a, a very policive um, application and, and the use of the, of the application was in the end very related to, to the police needed to, needs to get people inside and complaining with quarantines. Uh, so the families module, for example, cross-checked identity, social benefits, and a lot of uh, official databases. Also for the working information, they had uh, the verification of businesses. So you went to a business and they were they verified that you were part of the module, the families module, and they also operated the permits, uh, permits for companies to open. And the most important use was the a connection between one person in the families module with uh, the exemption uh, from the lockdown to go out to work. But in this case, people had to register with their employer. And that uh, next one, please. The other case uh, in which data came back to people, uh, surveillance and punishment, was this example. As you see, there is two captures from a media uh, from a, a media outlet and the official channel of the of the municipality. They use teams and they use the GPS capabilities on people's cell phones to comp to make sure people were complying when they were positive for COVID that they were complying with uh, the space, the geographical space they were registering as home. So uh, when the GP GPS showed people moving out of these places, they sent a hunter team, which is the name, the actual name they put to this team, the COVID hunter team, uh, to get back to a hotel and to a place for them to comply with the lockdown. So this is this is generally speaking the, the situation in which these in two particular applications in Medellin and Cali, they moved from helping citizens and to, uh, yeah, helping citizens with health or uh, self-reporting of symptoms or um, social benefits to policing. And in the end, the effects, this is the third part of the, of the presentation. 
uh, they came back as discrimination. So just as a context, I'm running out of time, but uh, more than 60 people have been killed in the recent protests because of the social situation here in Colombia, political situation. But uh, this is the product of uh, bio, uh, police violence. And they're not all, they are not all confirmed cases, but they have been uh, happening inside or in the context of a process. So we have uh, justification and a lot of information on the police in our report, but in the end, we have to understand that police in Colombia is acting in a way that uh, is raising concerns on human rights protection. So when they were tasked with the protection of, with the um, enforcement of quarantines, what we had was a lot of violence. So two cases, uh, one of them was the, um, the, the many cases that we had of informal, the informal sector being targeted by the police. One of the issues in the, with the apps was that uh, the apps must uh, be registered in, let's say, for example, in the case of making exemptions to be out on the street, what they were supposed to be registered by their employers. So these ruled out by design the informal sector because they were not, they don't have um, they don't have any employer, and these are people that you know sell cigarettes or you know drinks or candy on the street. That's kind of and many people rely on that income. And the second uh, part of the decisions that that came to people were the localized uh, lockdowns. So when they, in Medellin, what they did was send uh, the military to keep people from going out of these um, neighborhoods. And people, that's why a stigma is there. People came uh, and they complained about being stigmatized by the media and the military and the uh, administration as people that were at high risk. And they, uh, they, the grounds for these decisions were the use of data. So all this information uh, is on our report. Uh, so that is, yeah, I, I just had, we had a lot of uh, other more points, but I'll be happy to uh, listen to any other questions or information I can give on, on this case, but thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can see me again. I think my, my picture is stuck, but you can probably hear me. Um, no worries. Um, thank you very much, Juan Diego, for, for sharing uh, all of this information and insights. Indeed, I think the report is a great resource. And uh, now we are going to move on uh, to, the, to the fourth presenter, which we are very privileged to have, Veridiana uh, Alimonti from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, who will, as I understood it, uh, put what we heard in uh, a regional and again in an international context. So please, Varadiana, the floor is yours um, and the picture also. Okay, thank you, Oscar. Thank you for having me. Um, this is a really interesting and qualified discussion on the issues that we are facing. So, um, to start, when we talk about using data to fight the pandemic, um, we have like a caveat or a caution uh, that is on how this can lead to new forms of surveillance and social control. And I would say that Juan Diego presentation is more than illustrative in this sense. Uh, so contexts of emergency are contexts of fear and tremendous uncertainty. And in Latin America, this is deepened by insufficient or precarious structures of social protection and historic institutional challenges. So unnecessary and disproportionate surveillance and emergency powers may be naturalized and are convenient in these contexts where society also urges for quick solutions that sometimes may come and often come as magical technological solutions. That's what we are talking about, having technological solutions that we should ask ourselves as a society and the governments also ha should have these answers for us as a society. If data-driven measure and technological solutions are indeed always a good or the best call. And in this sense, we come with the proper assessment and design that are related to Thais presentation, the first one regarding best practices, guiding principles, safeguards. Um, but it should start first on, um, on an explanation on, 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 and on resources on if these measures are adequate and would be effective to tackle what we want to tackle. Then afterwards, are uh, the, the design necessary and proportionate? And then what safeguards are there? 
um, consent, privacy and data protection by design, transparency and in this sense, also the importance of independent and third party audits, and also the, 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 what is related to the expiration, right? The exit of this, this measure. So uh, not only about the data, but also related to the powers. So the emergency powers should, uh, should not uh, last after the emergency situation is done. And also the data that is collected or should be deleted or minimized, thinking about solutions such as anonymization and so on. So we don't turn the new normal into a permanent state of perception. And um, I, I would like to share with you and make also an, an advertising of, no, please, the, 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 the other one yet. Yeah. So uh, there is a consortium of organizations in the region that Charisma is part, which is the old sort, 11 organizations in the region. They have put up an interesting, really interesting observatory of COVID apps. And one demonstration of what we are talking about on rapidly adopting technological solutions, what uh, be before actually thinking about all these issues, is the fact that most of the apps in chat and two chatbots that were researched uh, were adopted by March 2020, which means at the beginning of the emergency with this um, idea of a quick and magical solution to the problem. So you can now, next slide, please. And when uh, we think about uh, putting in perspective a bit what Christian already said on uh, the, the challenges of the region in terms of infrastructure, connectivity, and so on. When you think about designing policies in this context, we have to, and technological solutions, who is in, who is out, and how the, 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 techno, the techno, technological solutions are adopted. So please, next slide. If we think about, so there is the, 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 the infrastructure problem, the connectivity problem, and also the affordability problem. This is just, uh, one is snapshot of the region, the, the, the Americas region in the ITU report. And we see that in South America, for example, um, there is a large proportion of countries that which uh, the, the mobile broadband package, the cost of it represents from five to 10% of the global national income. And we also have to take into consideration that uh, in addition to the price, also, we have like data caps in the most available and, and, and cheaper um, uh, mobile broadband plans that we have in the region, which also limits the use of applications, for example. So um, the next slide, please. Another issue is the digital skills that we have uh, to use such technological solutions, to use apps and other uh, solutions that we might have. And if we go to the standard ICT skills that considering ITU methodology would involve, would, would involve the standard ICT skills, finding, downloading, installing, and configuring software, most of South America is actually in the world, in the worst part of the, uh, of the digital skills. So from zero to 20% of the population would have them in most of the countries that are colored in the map in South America. Next one. And there is also the, uh, the issue of the impact on fundamental rights that Christian and, and Juan Diego already talked a lot about, and you can find more in, in the also report, but it relates to disproportionate data collection. It relates to conditioning the subscription to the app to access public interest information regarding the, the pandemic. It relates to mobility certificates that may have impact on uh, freedom of movement and also, I mean, and also um, features related to crowding com complaints and reports that in one side, it's important to avoid crowding and agglomeration for sure. But in the other side, it's important to take into consideration that the region has, has been passing uh, in different countries from uh, periods of social sparks and protests also related to the situation um, the economic situation derived from the pandemic. So this is also something to take into consideration. And also uh, labor rights, considering the mandatory use of the app for certain professional categories in some countries um, like Argentina. Please, the next one. 
So thinking, um, building on these issues regarding the apps and the technology already um, put in place, it's interesting to take a brief look uh, at immunity and vaccine passports that are popping up more and more in different countries and also in, in, in the region. Um, so far, the World Health Organization um, has a position that it shouldn't be mandatory considering all the critical uncertainties that we have, considering how the immunity or even the vaccination, the immunity derived from vaccination really plays out considering other variants and how long the immunity lasts and also um, the importance of using other, um, other uh, measures to, to avoid infection. One point that was really important that they, they made is that um, considering that there, was, there is limited availability of vaccines, preferential vaccination of travelers could result in, adequate, in, in, in inadequate supplies of vaccines and making those mandatory could make this distortion. Uh, so we have, some initiatives already going on. For example, the European Union one is not focused only on vaccine. You can use tests or even uh, the proof that you covered from the virus. In uh, the region, we have different countries. This country is there, Chile, Uruguay, Argentina, and Paraguay, and Colombia. Um, also in May, it was announced that they, uh, had, they had signed an alliance, a regional alliance to create a vaccination certificate uh, funded by the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Health Organization, uh, but also they have their own initiative, their own initiatives. And in Uruguay and Argentina, for example, we have both initiatives related to travel, international travels, but also initiatives or pilot, pilot tests regarding the displacements uh, in the country, local displacements, also to go into public spaces like stores or uh, cultural spectacles. So this is also something that uh, not only to travel, international travels, but also inside the countries. Uh, in Brazil, um, there is um, the, the app that we have from the public health system, you can issue uh, a vaccination certificate and the Senate has also approved in June and the Chamber of Deputies have to, to have to is still um, assess it, something that could also be used internally, uh, a certificate that could also be used internally. They are usually digital based uh, with the issues that we talked before wh when it happens, uh, considering access to technology and so on. Uh, but they they often have also a paper alternative that you have to print a QR code and so on. So uh, the issues that we brought, considering the disparities on this, remain in here, considering access to technology, digital skills, and also access to vaccines and tests um, in the in this case. So if we see this this map of uh, our world in data, we see there is, is still. Uh, uh, a disparity, a global disparity in terms of people vaccinated, although these uh, passports uh, still accept other, uh, other kinds of data, for example, testing, but even the test, the, the next one, please, we also have uh, disparities on the testing policy or the, the, the proportion of the population tested, the affordability of the test, for example. So one thing is someone that is Take, taking an international travel and probably would have perhaps the money to do it if this is not uh, a, a, a someone, a, a, an immigrant or a refugee in a complicated situation. But if this also becomes regular inside the country, it can be a problem considering also the affordability of tests. Next one, please. And further concerns. So uh, another further con another concern is is related to the risk communication, the communication of risk. Um, because what does the certificate really mean? It means that you are protected and that you can uh, stop using other protection measures. Uh, it doesn't mean that. So this is um, this is part of the report of the DPB and EDPS in Europe about the, the EU certificate that it should be understood as a factual proof that someone is vaccinated, but it shouldn't uh, lead to other con con conclusions uh, beyond that. And this is important also for the population continue the protection measures. Next one, please. It can bring also, and considering the issues around digital skills, 
um, new, infosec, new infosec vulnerabilities if they don't have a proper security in, uh, structure and measures in the, in, the, in the development part, but also in terms of digital uh, skills, also to be sure that you are, for example, downloading the right app, that you are taking the measures that uh, is, are important considering the, the secure use of these apps, and also forgery possibilities. And to finish, what is really important um, in a perspective that EFF has been dealing with uh, the issue of immunity and vaccine passports are that this go, the, this, these certificates, they go beyond paper, right? They create a new infrastructure and culture of doorkeepers to public places. Um, they entail a, a new infrastructure um, that in which public places regularly will require visitors to display a token as a condition of entry. And this can also be a giant step towards pervasive tracking of our day-to-day -day movements. Um, and also how corporations will monetize the data that will be um, collected, the risks attached to data breaches, and also law enforcement abuses perhaps in using this data. Um, and this come and this come with many uh, discussions if we consider, for example, um, initiatives in the region and other countries to create national identity, uh, digital databases, how the, the, the private sector can use and repurpose this data. And to finish, um, the fact that we have different levels of uh, data protection laws, uh, different levels of protection in the region when it comes to data protection laws and authorities and enforcement authorities. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very, Gianna. I tried again. <laughs> I'm afraid my, I'm still uh, stuck. <laughs> but you can hear me and I can speak. Wonderful presentation. Uh, many very valid concerns. I'm very glad to have you on the panel because all of these are also things that, uh, particularly the aspects about the vaccine passports that you mentioned in the end, which are also very dear to, to, to my thinking. And so very thank you very much for bringing this up. And then last but not least, um, we still have uh, Oshrat's presentation. And I'm also very, very much looking forward to this presentation because Oshrat has been carrying out a very interesting study on uh, the user's perspectives on uh, digital uh, contact tracing apps. So Oshrat, the floor is yours. Your presentation will be on in a second. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, I'll wait for the presentation, I can just start. Um, so how, first, wow, well, I'm so happy to be, to be able to hear all this wonderful presentation and super interesting. So thank you for inviting me and happy to be here today. Um, so thank you, I'm Oshaka Yellow and I'm a presenter. I'm a postdoc at Max Planck Research uh, Institute. Um, and I'll present a study uh, that was done um, by myself, the Dana Tuchman and Elisa Redmile um, from the Max Planck Institute. Uh, and in this study, we wanted to ask um, the very big question is how to make people adapt these apps. So I feel like a bit going backwards <laughs> to both compared to the presentation up to now and also in comparison to the time that we are right now, like year after, more than a year after the pandemic had started. Um, so you can move to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so as I said, <laughs> back in time. Um, so think back to the beginning of the pandemic, um, probably most of you may, may remember um, the Oxford uh, study that there was a, this magic number that people uh, should, that should be adopted, the contact tracing app should be adopted by 60% of the population in order to be effective. In the same research itself, they said it could be also less than 60%, but that, that, that's the number that people caught, the media caught. Um, but the idea was if we want the app to be um, effective, they should be adopted by the people. Um, so that's the background for this study. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so when we come to design information system in general and in the context of our uh, panel and uh, designing contact tracing apps, um, there is the expert, uh, then they provide um, their view and really as we also hear in this uh, same uh, panel that the, uh, 
privacy aspect was very uh, prominent when coming to design um, the, these app, uh, and it was really all about privacy and how to make um, these uh, contact tracing app uh, to keep as much as possible to a certain extent, yeah, we, <laughs> we discussed earlier, uh, how to keep the, the user's privacy um, in mind when coming to design this app. But, Oscar, please, what about the users? Um, so, again, also in general, when we come to design uh, information system, and again, in this one in particular, we need to ask what about the users, what do they think? Because again, if we want to reach to 60% or less, as we found later, um, adoption rate, we want to know to have a, a comprehensive uh, picture of it. So we need to know what they care about and to ask them. That will help us. Thank you. The next one. So with this in mind that we need to involve the users, uh, so this study came to um, had two main questions. So the first one was, what factors are most important in people's intent to adopt COVID-19 app? So that was the first thing. We will ask about privacy, but what about other things uh, that will make users to adopt the app? Um, and also for the next uh, section, ask the next question was, if we offer people direct incentive, think of money, and it really was money, um, will that affect their intent to install a COVID-19 app? Again, it just really we need to go back. We need all people wanted, I mean, people, countries, that people will adopt this app. And that was the motivation, and that was all the study about. Okay, so the next one, please. Um, so to answer our question, we, con we conducted a study, um, in, which is conjoint analysis study. Um, and the idea of conjoint analysis methodology is where um, you can press the next click. Uh, the idea of conjoint analysis is where participants are presented with, in this case, two options. Um, and they had to choose between the options. And it's the thing with specific with conjoint that they are presented with several features and not just that one thing that we want to check, but several things that we want to check at the same time. Um, so, so, so the respondents were we basically picked like between these two pairs, and they they were they read that imagine that there is a mobile phone app intended to help combat the coronavirus in the U.S. And now, so they were presented with two different apps, and these apps had these features. I will go to the to these features. So. They had uh, we had a feature related to the app accuracy, so it's a contact tracing app. It should be able to contact tracing, right? To notify the people in case of exposure. So um, that was one thing, the one feature. Uh, the other thing was the mobile data, the, how much it cost uh, to the to the user, um, a battery life, the battery consumption of this app. Um, I'm skipping to the benefits. Okay, the benefit was. Um, Things related to, uh, for example, in, in personal and social benefits, for example, reduce the number of people in general infected with coronavirus, or the other option was alert you in case of exposure, that's in the benefit. And we also had three, um, three features uh, that are related to privacy. Um, so it was information that could be revealed, what information is collected, and where information is stored. So these were the features, and they were different between the, and the levels were different between uh, the two options. So participants could choose either one option, option one, option two, or they could say none of them. I don't want to. I don't want to adopt any of these. Uh, any of these suggestions now. And they were repeatedly. Uh, so they were presented with this uh, several times, and they picked it. So that's how the study uh, was designed. Um, you can move to the next one. Um, in terms of participants, uh, so we have uh, approximately 1,500 participants recruited from the U.S. Um, and they we use the company to recruit these people, and they that they conducted this experiment. Thank you. The next one. Okay. So what did we find? I'm I'm going back to the question. So the first question was, what factors uh, do they care about when they're coming to maybe installing the app? If you want to convince them to install the app, or what do they care about? Um, so remember the features I told you I showed you before. So we have so we see the two main features that the participants cared most about was a privacy. We had three features that were related to privacy. That 90% of the like so it's like how important it is for me like. 
the important uh, word for about privacy and then accuracy. Okay, so the app's main function is to inform the user in case of exposure. They wanted to be to really do that. If it does that only not enough time, uh, not enough percent of the time, so it's not good enough. Um, so these were the most important things uh, when people are coming to maybe adopting the app. And then we had other stuff as the mobile data and the, ben the, the benefits, whether it's like, like, we, like for social uh, social benefits, it's personal benefits, and so on, and uh, the battery consumption. So that was the first question, what, what do they care about? So it's accuracy and privacy. The next one, please. Thank you, Oscar. Um, the next question was, if we're paying them, will that affect their adoption? Um, so um, participants, we had three different conditions. Um, we had condition in which, if you remember the benefit thing that we had, so some participants were um, randomized to, and they were only asked about these kind of benefits, for example, alert you in case you've been exposed and so on. So that was one condition. And we had two other conditions. So we actually um, um, suggested them uh, external incentive one of them, which uh, health related, uh, for example, any healthcare you need for coronavirus infection will be free. And again, it's US. Uh, health thing is important. It's expensive in the US. Okay, so that was one thing. Um, that was one condition. Uh, and the other condition was money. Uh, we offer you $20, $20 gift card. Okay, so we had three conditions and we wanted to see if we offer them money, will that make a difference? And the answer is yes. Okay, so what you see here, um, as long as, as it goes negative, it means uh, that they don't want um, to uh, install the app. Um, so with the, in the case of benefits, it's the lower, and uh, you see a significant difference between the health and money, meaning that once we uh, offer them uh, either money or health-related uh, incentive, they were more willing to adopt this app. So that was the second question that we asked, and we found that the answer is yes. And next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and in addition, another result, uh, one of the other results, we have others, um, that it's not that it's only in offering them external incentive as money or healthcare, it's not only made them to um, um, cause them to more installing the app, uh, it also changed what type of app uh, are they willing to install. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, for example, in the case of mobile data, uh, so once we offer them um, external incentive, help, or money, they care less about um, their mobile data usage. So we think that once we offer them money, so they care less about the other thing in the app that they are paying for, which we, in, in the case of the, the mobile data usage. So once, um, in the case of health and money, we see that they care less in the case of um, the mobile data usage. Um, thank you. Next. And then one. Um, so to summarize, um, so we found that for COVID apps, yes, as experts said, privacy really matters to the users, but it's not the only one. It's not the only thing. People really care about that the app does what it's supposed to be doing, and that's notifying them about the exposure. Uh, and also we found that if we want to, back then, when people really thought that that's the thing, um, um, contact tracing app, so if we want to increase the adoption, uh, then uh, we can do, uh, to some extent, if we offer them money, uh, healthcare money, external incentive, if we pay them, it might call, it might help with uh, increasing their adoption. And thank you very much. That if we have time, we can discuss it later. Thank you. Does this work? No. <laughs> no worries. It will have to, to remain a still picture. I will I will see what I can do. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, I saw that we got some questions from the audience, right? So there was a question for Vergiana by Hannah J. Draper. Uh, and the question is, where is the evidence all these new and different and evolving types of data collection even mitigate contagion. So maybe it's also something uh, Oshant wants to chime in. Uh, so is it is it actually working? Mergiana, do you, what's your view on that? 
Yeah, so others also can help me on that, but I don't think that we have actually this evidence to back all uh, this kind of surveillance measures that you're seeing. I mean, of course, in some countries that, for example, the apps were um, had a greater adoption, this, this didn't happen uh, in, in South American countries, as for example, other countries in Europe, for example, but even in those, we should take into consideration how this plays out with other measures that were taken, right? like massive testing, like lockdowns. So sometimes these technological solutions are seen as magical and split from all the other measures to contain the pandemic that seem also to be, you know, that can be also more effective like lockdown. So um, this is important to have into consideration. And also uh, the disproportionate way that they may adopt, they may be adopted considering disproportionate data collection, personal data collection, where they shouldn't, they don't need it to be personal data. Uh, so, I mean, considerations like those. Seems like camera feed, video feed has, is alive again. Great, wonderful. So, Osha, do you have do you have anything to share? I mean, I I must admit. So, I also followed just as you this topic for over yeah since since the beginning, and. Uh, I, I I'm aware of the Oxford study. I read a lot of media publications afterwards that less than 60% is needed for it to be effective. I know that there are papers who claim that it is effective and yet I'm still not convinced that it is effective. So I'm particular when I look at the evidence from, from Germany, but again, maybe Oshrat, you know more than I do. Um, there is, it's very, very mixed. And I think the biggest problem is how do you, how you define effectiveness in the first place. But uh, Oshrat, what, what is your opinion? Um, thank you. So, yeah, I'm, I will join what Varian said. I, from my perspective, I, I don't know how effective it is yet. Um, and we all read, uh, actually, the link you said with the papers contradicting each other, not sure about um, how do we measure effectiveness. Um, it's really it's a good question, and I think that we not really actually have the the answer. Um, and so I, I will just we're really going to join um, what what Diana said about that that we we don't know yet. But and I will add that we're really looking for not collecting data um, from private perspective, right? Um, but I wonder up to what and to what point we're not collecting data in a way that we're not able to measure how effective are we because we did not collect the data. Um, so just for example, if we're not collecting uh, the location and only using the, you know, just losing the QF, really in intention not to collect the data to minimize it, then for example, we're not able to know areas that had specific more, um, more, corona, uh, more corona, corona cases and so, and so we're keeping privacy from one hand, not able to measure things if there's any change on the other hand. So it's really this trade-off that is always the trade-off with keeping privacy. So. Yes, but but uh, to, to personally counter a bit, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm, because I, obviously there's always like this trade-off discussion, right? Security, privacy, in this case, it's self-security. But uh, I think what you, when after more than a year, when you run those systems, when you still have this discussion and all of a sudden it appears that you cannot measure effectiveness or uh, that, that it's unclear how to, uh, how to evaluate the systems, then that for me is a clear indication that the whole process was totally rushed. It was, it was just done to immediately respond to something and to, see, to, to, to actually show you're being able to do something, but at the same time, it was not clear when it would be successful. And for me, I mean, we see that with other technological innovations as well, but I also uh, think Juan Diego would like to chime in and also Christian on this. Juan. Yeah, uh, no, just, I, I think Colombia is a very good example of what you just said, because we didn't have up the, the stated objectives of these apps were uh, public health and uh, managing the, the pandemic, but what we had is control. So I guess you could, you could have two answers, right? They were not real, COVID apps, let's say, because they were not addressed to that. But I would tend to uh, favor a second answer, which is what we had in the end, or at least the case that Colombia could be exempt of, 
is that uh, presented as COVID apps, what we had was control apps and the creation of information infrastructures without a clear objective that is very difficult to control now because of all the cases I talked uh, about. I don't know exactly what is happening, what is going on right now, but we know the cases are just going up and they have been up. And even we even have more cases now that we had when the apps were in full uh, deployment. Okay, I see. Christian, Osha wants uh, to come back, but first Christian and then Osha. I just wanted to say there's there's two two different uh, levels to answer this question. First, we have to answer before what kinds of uh, data we're talking about and what kinds of technology we're talking about. So, uh, and then we can move on to the effectiveness of uh, them. I think it's very important to have in mind that uh, having data might be an important tool to actually understand how the, the, the pandemic is going on and what are the actual measures, the effectiveness of the measures that we're taking actually. So we're talking about isolation, talking about staying at home, talking about um, even the use of masks and all this kind of stuff. It's important to have data. So this is one thing that we have in mind. And, and there is something that's lacking in many countries in Latin America. We don't have enough uh, information so in this case, enough data in actually to understand which kinds of measures were actually affecting, which kinds of measures weren't. So this is, a, this is the first level. And what kinds of technologies? So talking about apps, it's, it's sort of a, making a, a big thing from many, many different things that actually are being deployed. So we're talking about contact tracing apps. We talk about uh, apps that talking about many, many, many aspects of that. So chatbot apps also were appeared. So apps that were just uh, giving information. So there's a plenty of different apps that, that have very restricted types of, uh, of effectiveness. And we have to understand that this is supposed to be. And the last point, the different types of technology have a different impact because of the different uh, contexts in infrastructure, access access to technology, access to uh, to actual data to be compared with, to to blend with, to make big data out of it. So it it was not a matter of having one contact tracing app that would actually have a, an effective impact in, in stopping the contagion, in stopping the pandemic. So uh, different types of data, different types of technology, different types of infrastructure, all that has to be uh, uh, on the table so that we can actually answer the question that's been uh, put before us. Mm, yeah, and I think you could, uh, it's already great, but I think you could even add different societies with different connectivity things. All right, Osher, please. Agree. No, that was really the only thing I wanted to, to add. Like, it's like, we have the Israeli case that we have in Israel, we have the surveillance and versus like an app and we have uh, Singapore. So we really have to have into this question, to the answer the question, we really have to, what you just said, to where, where is it, where is it uh, to answer the question? Mm -hmm. Okay, Thais, so, so Oscar, you... if, if I do that, yeah. one tiny little thing is that you were quite right because there is also the, the fact that's in how, how people interact with these types of technology from the standpoint of the academic, the technical society, but also the cultural uh, world in, in our sense. So uh, if people are going to actually use the app, even for, for taking the example of Ashra mentioning, if you give some uh, economical incentives, okay, people might download the app, but will they have it on? Will they actually allow this to, to go on? What are the types of controls that we have? So you're, you are 100% right. There is a cultural aspect with how people interact with those types of technology themselves. Mm -hmm. But, but Thais, at the same time, I think uh, we see, although we are, I think we all seem to agree on the cultural embedding and societal context matters, of course. But at the same time, when you study past practices, there also seems to be a, a relatively um you know recognized set right at least on a very abstract level or or how would you see that yes i think we can uh, establish this very broad uh, guidance uh, and i think they are important in all cultural settings in all societies uh, because these are things that are agreed upon that are important to be followed um, and also to add to this debate i think uh, one point that viridiana raised before uh, i think uh, was uh, questioning if things should be developed 
so for example, in Argentina and Chile, they developed these self-testing apps, for example, to test for symptoms for COVID. Uh, and they were collecting, uh, when people downloaded the app, they had to input a lot of data and for personal information, and they were adding a lot of sensitive data as well to this app because it was about their health uh, problems and issues. Um, so I think this also creates this uh, bigger question that we have to ask ourselves. Is this really necessary to be developed in the first place? And then uh, what the other says, what uh, this will lead to as well by the end. So I think that uh, following these guiding principles, uh, the best practices, I think it's a very good uh, point when you are developing something new. But uh, then again, ask is important to ask if uh, that is really necessary. Okay, so I think we have like time for a very short last round, and this last round would be about, from your perspective, uh, also taking into account what you presented, what would you wish for in terms of exit strategies, right? So we, we had this in, I think, all of the, the presentations for one way or another, there was the question of the legal uh, framework and the necessity uh, to a certain extent also that these, these measures are time limited. And I would like to, to start with Juan Diego, whether from your perspective, whether in, in Colombia, you, uh, you are um, you know, afraid of or concerned that these measures will stay in place or which kind of exit strategies you you see maybe people are just not, not even using it or yeah absolutely uh, apps uh, are not as prominent in the public discourse uh, these days and we are having more cases now that we had last year so uh, apps apparently disappeared and also um, i think uh, uh, regarding uh, thai's last remark i think it's very interesting because one question for us, not only not only regarding the, the COVID apps, but in general, the use of technology by the government or for particular purposes. What I what I wonder is, uh, and, and you know, an exit strategy would be an answer to this question is when exactly we must, in my case, the civil society or academia, we must uh, get uh, to these questions and what would be the control measures we need for actually getting the governments to answer to the question, why do you want to do these? What are the proofs that you uh, need these? Because we've been talking about this for a long time and we kind of know what is the problem, uh, but we haven't found a way to actually mm -hmm. stop them before the damage is done, right? So I guess I guess one, one way to move this question forward is particularly measures on how to involve other uh, people and uh, to actually get these questions answered before the measures are taken. Hmm. Okay, great. So I would like to everybody to respond on this, but please keep your answers as short as possible because we're we're approaching the end. So, where are Diana, when it comes to exit strategies, what are your thoughts? Okay, so just one tiny comment regarding the data-driven um, measures, considering aggregate and anonymized and anonymized data. We also should continue thinking about who is in and who is out, considering the technological basis of how this data is collected. And exit strategy, I mean, I think we are trying to think here on some of them and raising awareness and trying to be, uh, to think ahead or at least um, think about the problems that may come while the technology and other solutions are still developed. So uh, we should um, continue doing this job that we are doing in different areas that we are. And, and, and follow and monitor and, um, and push for all these safeguards um, mm. because the problems will go on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and the uh, individual remedies is indeed a question. Um, Oshrat, what's your view on exit strategies? Um, so or, should we, or should we keep using the apps because they're so great? I don't know. No, it's not that they're just so, so great, but it's, if we, okay. My take is, if if they if they if they benefit, okay, let's assume that there are some benefits in using the app. Which I'm not saying again, we don't have these measures to uh, set it if they are benefits or not. But if they do, um, so my take from my perspective is really ask the really involve the users. There are really tons of ways to involve the users, user studies and stuff and stuff like that um, to see also their perspective. Um, and if so, we have the experts saying, okay, we should keep these stuff so mm -hmm. they won't hurt it. And I'm not showing to erode the experts, but I also see on top of that what users have to say. 
Yeah, that's a, I think that's a very good point. Christian. So I think we have a good news and a bad news. So the good news is that we are discussing exit strategies. So this is one thing. And this has happened in Brazil. We have it in one of the Supreme, case, uh, Supreme Court cases, discuss exit, we're discussing time periods, time frames. This is the good news. The bad news is that in practice, there are no exit strategies. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. And this is very well seen in our uh, um, emergency benefit app. There's nothing saying that they're gonna not going to keep the, the, the data. They don't know what's going to happen after the benefits. And uh, we, are, we don't have the, this clear case for what's going to happen in the future. So this is still a big discussion. So one good news, you're discussing one bad news. Well, it's in practice, it's not that clear. OK, great. Thais, what's your view? Well, I think those are all good, very good points. Um, I have not much to add. I think, uh, mm -hmm. as Juan has said as well, uh, I think we people will stop using uh, the apps with time. But then we see, again, new things coming, such as the vaccine passports. Uh, so I think we have to keep being critical and uh, discussing. And yeah, I think that's it. Let's yeah. see what happens I in the future. <laughs> Great, and I think that's also a, a good way for us uh, to end the discussion. Uh, thank you all so much, really, for participating, and all of you also for uh, for watching. And uh, it was really interesting uh, and very inspiring to talk with you about this topic. Unfortunately, I think we will keep talking about this, right? Um, but it's good that uh, there are some colleagues who uh, keep their eyes out there and do the research. Obviously, uh, the nicest thing for me that I can imagine how to do is we, if we were actually in Rio and now could go somewhere close to the beach and drink a caipirinha or whatever you would like uh, together. Uh, but uh, we do that next time. And uh, for now, uh, thank you again. Have a nice day, a nice evening, wherever you are. Take care, uh, stay safe and stay healthy.